Have you ever wondered what makes you you? How can you say you're the same person as you were yesterday? In this lecture video, I'm going to be looking at John Locke's uh, um, chapter from uh, his epistemological work called Of Identity and Diversity, where Locke is going to explain how it is that we can think of ourselves as the same person that continues uh, to live uh, that was the same person yesterday. It might actually challenge your intuitions a bit about how you think of yourself as you. So some questions to begin with, some questions that we'll be uh, uh, dealing with that we will be able to address. Are you the same person that existed yesterday? I mean, this might sound a bit ridiculous to ask. You know, why wouldn't I be the same person that I was yesterday? But let's think of it this way. Are you the same person that you were last year or 10 years ago? Certainly your beliefs probably in some way or another change over the last 10 years. Your, your likes, right, whether that be music or whatever else, probably changed to some extent over the past 10 years. Why then would you be justified in saying that you are that same person when we can identify certain traits, and you probably might have looked different as well, that were different, such that, as we commonly say, you know, I can barely recognize myself, or when we see friends, perhaps, um, that we haven't seen in a while, right, and they might say, wow, you look different, or something like that, or, you know, a relative who's like, wow, I can't believe, you know, you're the same person as when I saw you when you were a baby, or whatever. There are certain ways in which we actually might be justified in asking, are we the same person? I mean, think about in a, a long-term relationship, right? Sometimes people say, you know, you've changed, you know? Well, are you still married to that person? Is that the same person you married, for example? What about if one person had all their thoughts and memories uploaded to a robot? Would they be the same person? So if you had a robot that had all of your thoughts, all of your memories, so they acted as you do now, they could remember all the past events, uh, just as you can, everything about your life, that robot has. And so that robot is able to act. And let's say, you know, uh, we won't go like full like ex machina, like the movie, right, where you had a robot dressed up. But let's say... Uh, you were talking to the robot um, through a messenger, right? Such that you actually would mistake them uh, as being not a robot, but the real person that you knew. Or even let's say they were able to display the voice and look as the person you know, that you are or whatever, right? Such that they would fool you in conversation. And they would do that forever because they had all of your thoughts and memories uploaded to their... I don't know, software, I guess. Would they be the same person as you? Or, finally, if someone drunkenly commits a crime, but because they were so drunk, they blacked out, and they don't remember committing that crime, are they responsible for that crime? Right? Maybe they get arrested and, and then sober up and they think, there's no way I could have done that. I would never have done that. I don't have knowledge of doing that. How could I be, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, committed and charged, you know, uh, uh, or how can I be charged and potentially sentenced for a crime of which I don't know that I ever did? I mean, of course, this does sometimes happen and these people are um, uh, um convicted and sentenced for a crime. Is that justified, right? I mean, presumably only justified if they're the same person. But why would they be the same person if they had no recollection of that at all? Now, Locke is an, emp an empiricist, right? He thinks that uh, all of our ideas originate from experience. That, specifically for him... There are no innate ideas. We're not born with anything. We are a tabula rasa or a blank slate, right? Such that 
We know nothing and we only grow up to think what our environment makes possible, what we experience, right, through those uh, various environments we might exist in. Now, like Hume, Locke thinks that uh, our experiences over time, there's enough repetition in certain things, which we'll get at in a moment, such that they're able to form simple ideas and complex ideas, right? So Hume has the idea of impressions leading to simple ideas and complex ideas, similar kind of thing here. Uh, it's a little bit different, though, with Locke, because Locke thinks that we have these two different kinds of experience. Experience of the outer world, of what he calls sensations, and experience of the inner world. So these would be reflections, perhaps on fear, love, willing, doubting, feeling, remembering, and so on. All these things that come from our mind that we can think about, right? And that very thinking of uh, 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 the contents of our mind, that is a kind of experience that informs us over time. Now, experience of the outer world through sensations. There's two different ways we experience things. Locke thinks first with primary qualities. So these are things that are independent of the observer. It doesn't depend on whether I'm viewing the object or you're viewing the object, right? So if I have this mug here, the primary quality of the mug that I'm going to experience is perhaps uh, its extension, okay? Um, extension, number, uh, location, these kinds of things are independent of the experiencer. But... You know, there's coffee in this. So, as I drink it, right, the taste of it, that is a secondary quality that is more dependent on the observer. Now, it's informed by, of course, the primary qualities. But then, how we take into account the color of it, for example, that is much more dependent on me. It's more subjective. Now, it's not entirely subjective. It depends on the fact that there is a cup here that... And there is coffee that has um, certain uh, qualities that are independent of my own experience or judgment of it, such that perhaps the coffee is liquid, right? But again, like the taste of it, the color, these kinds of things, the, the feel of it perhaps, are a little bit more uh, dependent. So, because our ideas all originate from experience, the knowledge we have of beings like that mug, they're derived from a repeated experience of that object, and specifically repeated experience of the object at the same time and place, such that I come to identify that thing as one mug, right? I mean, when I say I identify, I mean that it is a single object, which I experience the same object over and over. It has a certain kind of identity. So he says, in this consists identity, when the ideas it is attributed to vary not at all from what they were, that moment wherein we consider their former existence, and to which we compare the present. For we, never finding, nor conceiving it possible, that two things of the same kind should exist in the same place at the same time, we rightly conclude that, wherever exists anywhere at any time, excludes all of the same kind and is there itself alone now of course to some extent right this relies on uh, the law of non-contradiction it couldn't be the play the case that there is this same mug here and there's not the same mug here it couldn't be the case that this exact same mug is both here and it is over there right it can it's either this mug or it's a different mug These repeated experiences of the smug allow me to identify this as a mug. Now, there are three kinds of substances that we identify through um, uh, our experience, or, or, or the metaphysical makeup of those uh, objects, of those things that we can describe. And perhaps object isn't quite the right word, because we might think of object as something like this that I can hold and grasp. You can't hold and grasp, for example, God or finite intelligences. But these are things that we can think about, that we can identify, right, as being uh, unique in some way, right, different from other things. Uh, so God, finite intelligence is like the mind uh, and bodies. So this mug, right, would consist of a body. Now, when we're thinking about these things, there's a difference in thinking about it in terms of a numerical identity 
or a qualitative identity. So we can think of, for example, this mug as having a both numerical and qualitative identity in that the colors aren't changing over time. The colors remain the same, and it is the same mug in terms of it's just one, right? That is this mug. Now, we could think of uh, the cells in my body, right? Uh, there's a numerical difference in the cells in my body. They change over time, right? The makeup is different. The, quali the qualitative identity of those cells as well could, could change. We might think maybe the DNA remains qualitatively the same over time. God would be both numerically and qualitatively the same, right? Uh, the identity is not different. Specifically with regard to uh, the question of personal identity and the self, this is going to hinge on, right, whether not only am I the same numerical person, right, and that there's just one Austin with this body with these sets of thoughts, but also whether those sets of thoughts change over time, whether they're qualitatively the same or whether they're uh, 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 qualitatively different. So when we want to define perhaps the essence of any object, right, this consists in where they are in place and time, what their matter is, and how its parts are organized, such that we can say that's why there's a difference between, let's say, uh, a, a, a melted piece of wax and a hardened piece of wax, right? Perhaps uh, the place is different, the time is different, though, and the way its parts, of course, are organized then have changed. Now, for animals, the fitness of the organization and the motion wherein life consists begins together with the motion coming from within. So this is similar to, for example, what Aristotle argues in On the Soul, right? That there's a certain kind of force that distinguishes living beings from inanimate objects, where it takes me, right, an ex with an external force to this mug to move the mug around. But for me, for animals like cats, uh, for plants, right, that motion comes within. Now, it depends on, of course, um, nutrients and other external things, but it does not require, for example, another uh, object to move, right, the arms of that, you know, living being and so on. The identity of animals consists in where they are and how they are organized, however. This is not personal. For Locke, animals do not have personal identity. They have identity insofar as we can identify them as, right, when we name a cat, like Marshmallow or Sky Bear, right? These have a certain identity such that they are the same, but they don't have personal identity. Personal identity is something that comes from the self. Right? It is an ability to identify one's own identity. For Locke, animals don't have this, and we'll see why in a moment, because it's what humans have for Locke that makes us possible to have personal identity. Now, uh, crucially, for machines, according to Locke, the force of life, or that motion which moves them, right, comes from without and not within. Now, of course, he's thinking of ato automatons, where they have to perhaps be wound up, uh, which means the force of life comes from us wounding up the gears such that then they spin and then the automaton moves. Now, we might think of machines now such that they uh, are able to perform uh, uh, by themselves, where perhaps um, there's enough artificial intelligence that they could recharge themselves, right? They plug themselves into a wall to give themselves more, more battery power and so on, and they're able to move on their own accord. Now, in that way, that might challenge then what Locke thought was capable of machines. And in that way, we might be able to say uh, the, the, the force of life or the motion of machines comes from within. And that would then put machines more into the category of animals, actually, perhaps. Uh, although that, that's still debatable. But it would definitely remove them more so from inanimate objects. But okay. Why do animals lack personal identity? Why can we say there is 
you know, the, the, the cat uh, marshmallow is different from the cat sky bear. Well, being a human is different from a person. So a human is something that has a particular composition and exists in a certain time and uh, a certain place in time. So we can think of this as just the kind of metaphysical identification of, right? What is a human? What the essential feature such that all humans possess this, right? And they don't possess something else. And all humans can exist in certain places and times. And we can say uh, Austin was a human being. Brandon was a human being. Akanksha was a human being. Gabby was a human being, etc. right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have personal identity. All we're doing uh, 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 thus far is saying there is a distinct human being, right? Such that this is like a species of, uh, we could say the genus, human beings, right? The different, you know, Austin, Gabby, and so on. A person, however, according to Locke, has conscious reflection. This is what animals lack for Locke. They lack the ability to have conscious reflection, to think on uh, uh, their past uh, actions, what they did yesterday, what they did a year ago. To reflect on, you know, maybe they're hungry, but they're going to wait. They'll eat in like an hour or two, right? They're going to play now, eat later. The idea for Locke is that a, a cat just, you know, it, it, it's instantaneous nows, right? Uh, and this is this idea that animals are... are, are are guided by instinct, right? So they're hungry, they go eat. They want to play, they go play. They're tired, they go to sleep. Now, perhaps there's uh, uh, various competing sensations, desires, and things like this, but there's no reflection such that they can say eating is more primary, sleeping is secondary, right? Human beings can do that. That for Locke, personhood is consciousness extended back. What this means is that personhood is the ability to reflect on previous states of consciousness, to be conscious of previous states of consciousness. That we survey our series of thoughts over time, we distinguish our own series of thoughts from those series of thoughts of others, because we're able to reflect on certain things. We're able to have certain memories, right? I have certain memories that you don't have. If you had all of my memories then, and you could reflect, you could extend your consciousness back to those previous states of consciousness, then you would be me. But you're not, because your memories are different from my memories. And I can be uh, aware of my memories, think on them, and then act on them. Take them into account on how I act going forward. So Locke says, we must consider what person stands for, which I think is a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and, as it seems to me, essential to it. It being impossible for anyone to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive. Now, how does this work? If conscious, if, if personhood is consciousness extended backwards, then do I need to be conscious of all the previous states of consciousness? Because I bet you probably aren't. So how, you, you might worry, oh no, am I really me, right? Am I really Austin? But Locke says, all you need to have a memory of is the immediately preceding state of consciousness. So I don't need to know everything that happened prior to my life. All I need to know is what happened most recently. And of course, most recently, I would have had memory of what had happened most recently to that one. So for all I need to, uh, all, all that's required is that we have consciousness of the immediately prior moment, such that that immediately prior moment had a memory of that immediately prior one, and so on, of course, ad infinitum. But we don't actually need to know the whole series of, you know, um, causal states of consciousness, we could say, right? Just the fact that we remember a previous state, the most immediate uh, previous state of consciousness, and of course, the assumption is, therefore, that we also 
uh, that previous state of consciousness when I was conscious, uh, when that one was in the present, I had memories of all the ones previous to that. Personhood is distinct from the body. So I can cut off this arm, and this does not mean I'm not still Austin, right? I mean, I'm losing my hair. The fact that prior me had more hair does not mean that uh, prior me was a different Austin uh, from myself, right? None of those things matter. All that matters, again, is consciousness extended backwards. So for Locke, the self is qualitatively identical with itself insofar as it has possession of and reflection on previous states of consciousness. But the self is not numerically identical because we can imagine consciousness removed from the body. We can imagine uh, an infinite number of uh, consciousnesses that are uh, uh, all possess the same memory that reflect on the exact same memory. So Locke says, thus any part of our bodies vitally united to that which is conscious in us makes a part of ourselves. But upon separation from the vital union by which that consciousness is communicated, that which a moment since was part of ourselves is now no more so than a part of another man's self is a part of me. And it is not impossible, but in a little time may become a real part of another person. So let's consider some uh, potential problem cases of personal identity then based on Locke's theory of personal identity. So first, can the same substance which thinks be changed and be the same person? So Descartes, for example, argues that we are a thinking substance that is the same over time, right? That for Descartes, I am the I, the ego, the, a mind, a soul. You cannot have half a mind and this mind is permanent. It's unchanging. For Locke, however, even if, well, and I should clarify, right? So for Descartes, then, uh, if the mind is our real self, it is qualitatively and quantitatively uh, um, the same. For Locke, though, even if our substance were to change, like our body, for example, or our memories, as they do over time, all that matters is how our consciousness functions. All that matters is that I have a memory of that change. That's it. Secondly, is resurrection possible? Well, for Locke, resurrection is possible insofar as one can link past and present together in the same series. So if someone were to die and then you were able to raise them back from the dead and they've remembered the you know last event from which they were alive, we could say that was the same person. Potentially then, right, for reincarnation. If one is reincarnated in another you know, body or whatever, after they've died, if they remember being that previous, you know, being alive in that previous body, then we can say it's the same person. But if they can't remember that, then for Locke, we can't say it's the same person. What about memory loss? For Locke, if your memory of a past action or event is wholly lost, then you are not the same person. If you had a car wreck and you cannot remember parts of your life because of that car wreck, you are a different person. You are no longer the same person as you were before. Right? I mean, this might seem striking. But again, for Locke, all that matters is how our consciousness functions in terms of being able to reflect on that uh, most immediate uh, state of consciousness in the past. If we can't do that, then we are a different person. We are not the same person because, I mean, think about it. All our behavior is going to be different. We're not going to have the same kind of tendencies in the way that we seriously reflect on our memories as persons. What if someone commits a crime but does not remember doing so? Should they be punished? Locke says that we can't know who did what, but we should pretend that we do. So if, for example, someone drunkenly right blacked out and committed a crime, 
And then they're charged with a crime. Locke says, well, we can't actually know whether or not that person that we just charged with the crime really is the person that committed the crime. But based on our experience, right, we can look at the person and we can say they are the same person. And so far as they have the same features, they behave the same as they did previous to the incident. So practically, we can treat them as the same person. And therefore, we're justified in basically pretending that we do know that they did commit the crime. Now, we might ask, though, if that's the case, why couldn't we just say the same thing about um, the person with memory loss? Now, with memory loss, it might be a bit more different because when someone does have severe memory, memory loss, their behavior might change. And in that case, we might say um, it's easier to understand that they are a different person and accept that as opposed to the person who uh, drunkenly, right, blacked out and committed a crime. But perhaps someone could still say, what's the threshold? And that's a good question, right? What is the threshold here for memory loss then that makes it so much more different than the person who drunkenly blacked out committed the crime? It's just similar to the, you know, the question over, you know, you have a heap of sand. Of course, if you take one grain of sand out of the heap, it doesn't make it not a heap. If you take 10 grains of sand out of the heap of sand, it doesn't mean that it's no longer a heap. But of course, if you keep taking grains of sand out of the heap of sand, eventually you're no longer going to have a heap of sand, right? You're just going to have one grain of sand left. What's the threshold such that it is no longer a heap of sand? It's unclear. And it seems to be unclear in this case as well with memory loss. Now, what I'm really wondering is how closely Locke's argument for personal identity affirms our intuitions of personal identity. Locke is very committed, of course, here to this idea that all that matters is consciousness extended backwards. And if we have that, we can say we are the same person. But I am inclined to think that we probably think of ourselves a bit differently. Why do you think we might think of ourselves a bit differently? And if we do, to what extent why, you know, might we be at odds uh, based on therefore our, our intuitions of personal identity? Why might we be at odds with uh, Locke's account of personal identity?